Good. We, um, we have a very intense program, lots of, lots of material to cover. Today is a, a fairly short time because we're starting at 1.30. We're going to about 6.15. The plan is to finish around 6.15, at which time we will then walk over to the Diaspora Museum where we will have dinner. I hope all of you are staying. Uh, we have a uh, comic showing up, uh, an English comic, and we will be finishing around 8.15, 8.30, at which time those who need buses will take you back to your hotels in Tel Aviv. If you have any questions, I'll be back here. I'm, we, I'm giving a presentation here and introducing Jens and then uh, Guy, and then I'm leaving. I'll be back here around 6 o'clock. Okay, any questions, anything? All right. Try to put your phones on vibrate, this way it won't bother the lecturers. We'll quickly go through that we have four lecturers. Today we have Dr. Guy Teltzur. I will introduce him when he gets up. We then have tomorrow Juicy Inko Enkovara, and then Dr. Alan O'Case and Oren Trupp on Thursday. And our three trainers, the three trainers, it's worthwhile to meet them and to know who they are because they're going to be helping you during the next three days. First one is Mordecai Putrashvili, over there in the back, standing up. Okay, let me do a quick introduction to Mordecai. He was selected as one of the 24 participants in the Prey Summer of HBC program at the Niels Bohr Institute at the University of Copenhagen, where he worked on state-of-the-art computer simulations in the Community Earth System model. He's a graduate student in the Department of Geophysical, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences at Tel Aviv University, Raymond and Beverly Sackler Faculty of Exact Sciences. So, Sciences. so that's one person you, who will be helping you. Next one is Jonathan Tal. Stand up. Hold you. Has an MSc in Mechanical Engineering from Tel Aviv University, the Department of, Food, of Fluid Flow and Heat Transfer. His thesis work was direct numerical simulation of turbulent flow in a pipe using a distributed memory parallel computer. After he graduated, he worked as an applications engineer and HPC consultant at Cray and SGI and worked closely with IUCC users, as well as other customers, to implement, optimize, and adapt their HPC codes for their machine's architecture. Today, he is an independent consultant. Our third person is Yossi, standing there, has been working for IUCC for the last year as an IT, as I, as IT for the Istra Grid project, including work on HPC cloud and cybersecurity. He has a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from Israel's Technion Institute of Technology and served in the Army as intelligence officer. Okay, those are the three people. Do you hear me? Am I on? Video? Audio? Hello, back in the back. Yes, I'm fine. Okay. So I'll try to quickly go through the HPC resources available through Prace. You heard this this morning. I'm not going to go through it again. There's six different computers in four different countries. And part of the training over the next four days is to how to use them and how to gain access to these systems. So I'm giving only the overview of how do you apply to get access to these HPC resources. All of this you can find on the internet, on the Prey site. But basically there's two different levels. There's a preparatory access and a regular access. Preparatory access is open four times a year, March, June, September, and December. And it's made specifically for testing. You're given between 50 to 250,000 core hours and you basically have to submit a request and you then wait a little bit of time and you get response and then you basically start using the price resources in a preparatory technical fashion. They check, to, they, the people in price will check to see that basically what you're submitting is not stupid. It's something that can be, you know, that, that needs to be run on one of the supercomputers. It takes about six weeks for them to do the analysis and they give you about, uh, and they award the project after about 45 days uh, after the cutoff. But they found out recently that there were too many people who applied and who never used and who received an award to use preparatory access, but somehow, sometimes had no 
or low consumption whatsoever. So they've now added another stage into their process where basically they will contact the awardee and say, listen, we've awarded you hours. Please confirm that you're available and that you're ready to start using them. And then they provide the access. That's preparatory access. Regular access is something totally different. Here, you can go up to anything above 5 million core hours. There are people who can even ask for 200 million core hours. And it's awarded on for a 12-month period. And it's intended for senior researchers. And it goes through a very much more intense technical and scientific review. If I'm talking too fast, that's how I am. I'm sorry. Take notes. This is all the slides are available on the internet. They're all available in our, on the site. So basically, they go through, and it's twice a year, February and September, where they issue the call. Call opens in February, and basically, you get access in September. The call opens in September. You get access in March. Lasts for about the call, the, when it's open, lasts for about six weeks. The evaluation process lasts about 15 weeks, a very long period of time. And they go through eligibility checks and technical evaluations and scientific evaluations. And they have three experts who check it in. It's a long process. So if you think, listen, I'm going to get access to a supercomputer you know, from today to tomorrow, it's not going to happen. You first have to go through the preparatory access. Then after you've successfully completed preparatory access, they will let you submit to regular. And if your paper and your request is worthy, then you will get access <coughs> on the regular call. There's an online application tool. Interestingly enough, it's located in France. It's not part of Price. Not exactly sure why. Um, and basically, it's an online application. It includes a mandatory PDF document that you have to fill out on all sorts of aspects. I'm not going to go through it because anyone who's interested has either done it or is planning to do it. All collaborators have to be identified. Uh, when you request it. It can't be where you just have one person and basically there's a whole team behind. You have to list all the people. Here's an example of the online form. You submit it and then you just sit back and wait your 15 weeks. Now, there are a bunch of Israeli uh, people who have actually gone through the, <coughs> the preparatory call or the regular call as well as access to Link Scheme and Link Scheme 2. Here is a list of the people who have agreed to help out anyone who's interested in uh, gaining access and who needs some kind of consulting help, assistance on managing these forms and gaining access, they're willing to help you out. <coughs> Eligibility, uh, you have to be in academia. Uh, you can be in industry, but then you can read the details. The company has its head office in R&D in Europe. Um, the, uh, you can ask for resources on a single machine. You can ask resources on multiple machines. You have to justify everything. It's a process. It's not something where you write out a one-page one napkin and request, you know, six million core hours. You have to fill out forms. After you gain access and you do something, then you have to report that you did it. You, have, you get no extension on the time. You basically get one year in which you will be running on their supercomputers. You have to acknowledge that you got uh, core hours on price, and you need to disseminate. You need to inform and publish uh, the results and, and indicate that you were using price resources. The peer review that price uses has a whole bunch of steps, also transparency, fairness, avoid of conflict of interest, standard things that I think everyone is, not, you shouldn't be surprised by any of this. And basically, you have a, uh, a graph, basically the proposal submission, technical assessment. I can go through this slowly, but I don't think that any of you really need to hear this in a slow version. Scientific assessment, right to a reply, yes, no. Things that I think everyone here, you know, who is at this level, we're not talking about elementary school, we're talking about people here in the university going to HPC systems. I'm sure you can all understand this fairly quickly. Technical assessment is done. Um, and the results can come back either fully complying with the system, suitable, or not adapted to the system. If you get not adapted to the system, then basically you're going to be rejected and your, your request for core hours is not going to be accepted. Um, you need a justified needs to use the price resources. 
you need the software availability. In other words, there might be certain packages and software libraries that you need. You need to specify them, what you're using, why you need to use them, whether they're available, whether they need to be extra loaded, whether you're going to purchase them. Uh, and all this has to be listed in the application. As I said, it's not a simple application, but it's worthwhile because you're gaining free access for a year to a supercomputer. <coughs> um, okay. Scientific assessment then is done. This isn't the technical assessment. This is the scientific assessment. Um, and they basically review to basically see whether what, you're, what you typed in and whether you, what, you're, what you're stating is feasible or not or whether it's basically uh, you would be considered a flake in your field. Um, has to have a merit of scientific excellence, novelty and transformative qualities. I'm not so sure that they always look at that. Um, the methodology that you're using, dissemination that you're planned to for the information exchange, management, all these kinds of things are standard in the forms. Resource all allocation. Once, suppose you apply and, and, and you get the, the nod that basically you are going to get resources. Problem is then maybe there's another 100 people who've asked for the, for the same 100 million core hours and there's not enough. So therefore they need to do resource allocation and decide based on the amount of resources being requested, whether it will fit into that particular supercomputer. And you can see that they make a single list. Uh, they list it by program, industrial and academic uh, proposals. And as always, there's always an FAQ available where you can go through and uh, have any questions that you, that you may think about are all available there on the internet. Um, but as I said, it's worthwhile to go through this process because if you have the need, this is where you're going to get supercomputer resources. Those who are here from Israel know that basically there's no supercomputer available here in Israel. There used to be about 15 years ago. Uh, we had a Cray located in Ben Gurion University. It's currently located, I think, in Bar Ilan University, uh, probably on its last leg, probably soon to be dumped in the Mediterranean Ocean since it's so old. But basically, there is no current supercomputer available for academia here in Israel, which is a bad state, not a good one, and hopefully one that we will correct in the future. All dependent on uh, the government showering money on academia, which really is not what they think about when, when they have money. 